Hello everybody, welcome back to this series of 100 videos for 100 cantos of Dante's Divine Comedy. Today we're going to read uh, Canto 18 of Paradiso, which is one of the best cantos of Paradiso. It's kind of a, a passage uh, canto because we are moving from the heaven of Mars to the heaven of Jupiter and so it's easily split in two parts. In fact, uh, the line that split the canto and the narrative is just before verse 52. So the verses until 52 take place in the heaven of Mars and the verses after 52 take place in the heaven of uh, Jupiter. Let me acknowledge very quickly this picture of the Joshua Tree Desert, which is a very unique, peculiar desert uh, east of Los Angeles that is very beautiful to visit, very unique in its uh, nature and composition. So I'm, I'm not in my house right now, so this is not part of, of my house, and I'm not even at work, I'm just in another location. When we read Canto 18, it almost feels like uh, Dante is almost realizing that he's been touching on so many painful topics and complex topics that he wants to center himself again here or his heart and going back and go back to the core of what the Divine Comedy is which let's remember is a love poem the greatest love poem ever written for any loved person in the intention of the author he said himself in the Vita Nuova or the new life that he would go and study like crazy and then write the greatest poem that's ever been written for a loved person, for a woman, in this case, Beatrice. So it's not a surprise that we start reading the first Herset and uh, this love for Beatrice is uh, once again in front of our eyes, in the center of Dante's heart, because really the Divine Comedy is about the love for Beatrice especially how the love for Beatrice was the way for God to reach down to Dante and save him and save his soul. Dante's ancestor Cacciaguida has been uh, on, on the stage, let's say, for already three cantos. It's a very long uh, permanence in front of our Divine Comedy stage compared to many other characters, in fact probably most of the other characters. And uh, here, in Canto 18, he will then uh, go back to be part of the angelic choir or the blessed souls choir, back in the cross-shaped uh, formation of the souls in the heaven of Mars. So at the very beginning, Dante says, Già si godeva solo del suo verbo, quello specchio beato, e io gustava lo mio temprando col dolce lacerbo. This reminds us that uh, in the previous canto, like I discussed with uh, Chiara, um, we've been uh, hearing uh, Dante talk about taste, the sense of taste. And uh, once again, nothing is ever a coincidence with the Divine Comedy. Dante is uh, recalling the, uh, the sense that he gave us in, uh, in the previous canto by saying gustava, which means tasting, uh, I was tasting my own thoughts inside, temprando col dolce lacerbo, the bitter taste and the sweet. He's referring to the type of feelings that Cacciaguida's words provoke in himself, in his soul. The bitter is, of course, the tale of his exile and everything that goes with that, with the pain. Uh, but the sweet is also the exaltation, not only the, the great news of uh, finding the right type of noble person who would protect him, like uh, Camerande della Scala, to whom Paradiso is dedicated, but also, and maybe more importantly, to hear that his scream, il mio grido si sentirà sopra, uh, his scream, in terms of his Divine Comedy, will be heard by so many, especially by the highest trees in the future, and so it's uh, an investiture it's an investiture that uh, glorifies the mission of Dante from Cacciaguida. E quella donna, and here we go back to Beatrice and Dante's love for Beatrice. Once again, Dante keeps going back to that fatal, fatal, crucial moment in his life. That probably is so important for all of us. That moment when 
he met with Beatrice and Beatrice smiled at him, acknowledging him, recognizing him, and then the way he describes it in the Vita Nuova, he ran home and had this type of mystic experience about it. He was beside himself. That moment is so important for all of us because probably without it, we wouldn't have the Divine Comedy today. We wouldn't have this magnificent uh, work of art. Everything stemmed from there. Dante always um, uses this moment as the anchor, as the anchor for all of his uh, emotions and especially for all of his love, love for God, but that was awoken, uh, was really stimulated initially by the moment when he fell in love with Beatrice. E quella donna che Dio mi menava disse, muta pensiero, pensa chi sono presso a colui che ogni torto disgrava. Change your thinking. This tercet, which is the second tercet, really reminds me how powerful is prayer and any type of spiritual engagement to change our moods. If we have worries, if we have anxieties, that generally are caused by thoughts. We are thinking about something and then we think about it again, then we think about it again. There is nothing like prayer or meditation, if you're not religious, that can really help you clean those thoughts away and start afresh, start anew, change your mood from within. This is what this particular terse sounds like. Muta pensier, pensa chi son presso a colui. I, Beatrice, I am next to God. You can see my image here in the heaven of Mars, but you know I am next to God. Think about what really matters and the beatitude that I am experiencing right now and that you will experience as well. From verse 7 to verse 25, 26, we have Dante once again singing and celebrating his love for Beatrice in such a, a genuine, genuine, spontaneous way. Io mi rivolsi, because he talks about love again, and now is cleansed Dante and purified Dante. So purified Dante knows what pure love is, and he knows to talk about love in a much more mature way than in Canto V of Inferno, for example. So, io mi rivolsi all'amoroso suono del mio conforto, e quali io allora vidi negli occhi santi amor, qui l'abbandono. I refuse to even try to describe what uh, beauty I saw in those uh, saint eyes of, of Beatrice. It's ineffable, but uh, then in the next verse he actually does try to, <laughs> to describe it, as always. Non perch'io, pur del mio parlar di fidi, I don't mistrust my own powers of communication, of writing, ma per la mente che non può redire sopra sé tanto, s'altri non la guidi. He's actually here, going back to the precise point he made at the very beginning of Paradiso, if you remember, where he was talking about the inability of our memory to recall some uh, uh, particularly intense spiritual emotions and spiritual experiences, because this is also what Christian theology says and said, especially St. Thomas Aquinas, that uh, there are some uh, experiences, especially high spiritual experiences, that our human memory cannot properly retain. So this is what Dante is referring to here. Tanto posso io di quel punto ridire, punto is point, but it means uh, the moment, the time, ridire, repeat, to say, che rimirando lei, lo mio affetto libero fu da ogni altro desire, all my emotions, my heart, were completely free from uh, any other desire, finché il piacere eterno che diretto raggiava in Beatrice, il piacere eterno is the eternal pleasure, therefore, God, that was directly shining in Beatrice, dal bel viso mi, con mi contentava col secondo aspetto, by being reflected indirectly in uh, the beautiful face of Beatrice was coming as reflected, a reflected ray of light into my eyes and it made me so blessed, so full of bliss and happy to the point that uh, he almost is risking to forget that he risks forgetting that Beatrice is not the source of that 
bliss and the light. She's only reflecting that, which is the entire point of pure love, of loving in a in the right way, to remember that everything that is beautiful, everything that is uh, greatest in this world, does not last and uh, is not sufficient for us. Here is where Beatrice, with uh, a loving scolding tone, uh, tells Dante, Volgiti ascolta, che non pur nei miei occhi è paradiso, which seems to be such a simple description. Look, heaven is not only in my eyes, and it's not my eyes, but you're almost behaving as if that was the case, Dante. Non pur nei miei occhi è paradiso, really, really beautiful. It's a gentle reminder, it's a gentle reminder to Dante that she is only a means, she's not what heaven is all about. These gorgeous initial passages, um, I always have in mind this, the, the beautiful quote by Dostoevsky, beauty will save the world, and these passages are all about beauty and love. And so the relationship between Dante and Beatrice reminds us, reminds me very much of the relationship between Raskolnikov and Sonia in Crime and Punishment. So I went to look up uh, one of my favorite scenes, the most uh, important, delicate, profound, moving and, and, and full of light scenes in Crime and Punishment, where Sonia, just like Beatrice with Dante, is the means that God is using to save Raskolnikov's soul. God is, is operating in Raskolnikov's life through Sonia in a very, very similar way that is operating through Beatrice in Dante's life. And here is a passage from, from the scene. What should I be without God? She whispered rapidly, forcibly. Ah, so that is it, he thought. And what does God do for you? He asked, probing her further. Sonia was silent a long while, as though she could not answer. Her weak chest kept heaving with emotion. Be silent, don't ask. You don't deserve, she cried suddenly. That's it, that's it, he repeated to himself. He does everything, she whispered quickly, looking down again. You can see in this incredible scene how Dostoevsky is playing with the, the outward weakness of Sonia and putting it in contrast with her inward strength. She looks, she sounds, she moves with so much weakness, but her words and her spirit are so strong. She really is absolute strength in this scene. While Raskolnikov, who obviously looks much stronger, he's a little aggressive and he's louder, he's lost. He is a lost soul, lost in the dark woods. If there was anyone who was lost in the dark woods, was Raskolnikov. So after Beatrice's reminder, Dante turns around and uh, towards Cacciaguida, and he realizes that Cacciaguida is bursting with the desire to talk to him again, to, to talk more to Dante. And he says, In questa quinta soglia dell'albero che vive della cima e frutta sempre e mai non perde foglia, this uh, tree that is upside down, that is always uh, taking its uh, nutrients, his livelihood from above, from the Empyrean, where God is. And this uh, Quinta Soglia is the fifth heaven, because we've seen so far the Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun and Mars. And so we are now moving from the fifth to the sixth heaven in the architecture of uh, Paradiso. What uh, Cacciaguida wants to do here is, uh, and what he's bursting with desire to do, is to introduce uh, other souls who, are, who belong to the heaven of Mars. So they are the fighters for faith, the, they be, they, their virtue, their spiritual virtue was mainly courage, and many of them actually died for, for faith. And so he's bursting to present them to Dante, and uh, I love one of uh, Father Paul's uh, comments because he, he says that here uh, it almost sounds like Cacciaguida is one of those uh, NBA presenters 
for, for each of the names, you're going to see the, a flashing light and a video of the player up on the mega screen. This is almost exactly what's happening here with the, with the cross of light, because as soon as uh, he mentions the name of the soul, the soul will flicker in, uh, in this formation, and uh, they're also uh, singing. One of these souls that Kachaguina mentions is Joshua. Joshua was the successor of Moses in the biblical history, who then led the Jewish people to their promised land. So Joshua, we see him uh, shown on the NBA screen and he gets presented. Then we have Maccabeus, then we have Charlemagne and Orlando. At, and I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention that Orlando is the Italianized or Toscanized name of Roland from the Chanson de Roland, a very famous literary character, historic character related to Charlemagne. They were champions of the defense of faith against the Saracens in the legends at least. And uh, one of the greatest works of Italian literature is in fact the Orlando Innamorato and followed by the Orlando Furioso by Ludovico Ariosto. They're both unbelievable poems. Um, Orlando in Furioso in particular, which literally is translated as the Raging Roland, is unbelievable because it has so much uh, surreal imagination and uh, creativity in it and profundity as well, while uh, having some tragedy, some comedy. It's a work that is uh, not very well known by the uh, international, let's say, readership. Um, and and even, even in Italy, it's not very well known. So that's it. We get to verse 52, and uh, Cacciaguida finally leaves the stage after having been there for, for three cantos and more. And uh, what is Dante thinking? What is he going to do? There is almost like a now what moment where Dante looks at Beatrice. Uh, you may rivolse the mio destro lato per vedere in Beatrice il mio dovere. I want to see what do I have to do, my duty. O per parlare, o per atto segnato, he has a moment of uh, confusion. E vedi le sue luci tanto mere, tanto gioconde, che la sua sembianza vinceva gli altri e l'ultimo solere. Here I have to make a comment because I don't know how it's possible that Dante planned to build a crescendo of luminosity in Beatrice's face and smile and eyes, in Paradiso in particular. If you remember the very first Cantos of Paradiso, Beatrice's smile has a certain light that shines on Dante, and then it's a constant, very gradual crescendo, but every time it's a little bit more, and then a little bit more, and then a little bit more. And through poetry, Dante is able to communicate this to us. The way that he uses the words here to show us how more luminous she is in the heaven of Jupiter are more intense than what he used uh, some cantos ago to, to show it before. So there is a constant yet very detectable crescendo and it, it makes me think of, uh, for example, a musical piece like uh, Ravel's Bolero, which is famous for, his, for its uh, very, very slow crescendo. And uh, in my history, many, many years ago, I remember an um, orchestra director speaking to a drummer, a friend of mine. He was a classical drummer, classically trained drummer, and he had to play this march sound during the Ravel's Bolero, and it has to be always the same rhythm. It's really probably the most important instrument of that entire piece, the drums because he has to start, and this director was telling my friend, when you start, when you start, I have to hear you come from 10 miles away. And at the end of the piece, you have to play so strongly, so loudly, that I have to vibrate, my body has to vibrate with the intensity of your drumming. And in, in between, there is a long classical piece that it's very difficult to really parse out. So that takes 
a completely different type of skills and techniques, but the concept is the same. This uh, gradual crescendo that Dante is able, I don't know how, to achieve with, with his poetry here. We are here, therefore, in the heaven of Jupiter, the heaven that celebrates the virtue of justice. And we can see almost immediately how from the glorious um, discussions of the heaven of Mars, we're going to move to the specifically spelled out legalisms of everything that has to do with justice, which is a nice, a very beautiful touch that Dante gives to, to this heaven. But before we get there, he introduces the heaven with um, an incredible, incredible visual uh, metaphor. He talks about this, uh, the color of a woman who is pale and white in her, in her face, but uh, when she is full of, of shame, she will redden. And this type of red is then going away from her face. That's the difference between the reddishness that Dante was seeing in the heaven of Mars and the pearly white that he's seeing in the heaven of Jupiter. There are also some uh, medieval scientific reasons for this, because the fact that Mars looked red had made ancient astronomers think that it was a warm planet, a warm star in their, in their astronomy. Uh, Jupiter was thought about as in between in terms of temperature, and then they had Saturn that was thought about as a cold star or a cold planet, based on, on their colors, really. With verse 73, Dante starts uh, this new crazy vision. It's a crazy, I call it crazy because only a hallucinatory imagination can give us this impression. I always imagine Dante, when he was writing these things, closing his eyes and with the extremely powerful eye of his mind, imagining these things happen. He would close his eyes and imagine these birds that rise from the riverbanks forming a round flock or another shape. These are the souls in Jupiter's heaven who are flying all together and taking the shapes of letters, letters of the alphabet. And we get the detailed soundtrack of this scene as well, because we know that uh, the souls are singing in a choir as they are taking the shapes of, the, of these letters. And then the, there is a moment of silence every time they uh, form a letter. Then, before forming another one, they will sing again and then silence again. Just try to imagine on the big screen. We would need to be on a really, really huge big screen in a cinema to properly enjoy this vision with at least the way Dante imagined it. Mostrarsi dunque in cinque volte sette. He saw 35, five times seven, 35 letters, vowels and consonants forming the following Latin words Diligite justitiam qui judicatis terra which means love justice you who are judging the earth in other words you who are the leaders who are, you who are the judges the people in power on earth are encouraged to love justice and this is, in fact, uh, the very beginning of the Book of Wisdom in the Bible. So it's a perfect introduction to the theme of justice. As if, visually, we were not stunned enough yet, once this sentence, all these bird-like souls have composed the sentence, the letter M, which is the last one, starts morphing and transforming, and first it morphed into a lily, and then it morphs again into a huge eagle, a golden eagle, which obviously has an echo of the golden eagle that we see in Canto VI, reflecting the Roman Empire. And this is still not enough. It's not enough yet, because he's also asking us to imagine this eagle, or this letter M, as an intarsium, as something that is an embossed golden um, jewel inside the silver of the sphere of Jupiter. So we have to, to imagine this uh, golden eagle as an embossed jewel 
within the silvery color of, uh, of Jupiter. Pareva d'argento, li d'oro distinto. Argento is silver and oro means gold. The tercet at line 115 I find really remarkable because in Italian it's, uh, it sounds like almost a, a tercet that is uh, inconsequential because it says O dolce stella star, quali quante gemme, gems, mi dimostraro che nostra giustizia, justice, effetto sia del ciel che tu in gemme. In gemme, you in gem, these are the neologisms that Dante was creating. But if you read the tercet, what you get in your mind is an effect of uh, sparkling. He is kind of taking a, making us step back and in front of this spectacle, making everything sparkle for a moment. It's, it's really, really beautiful. The canto ends uh, with a little bit of a, a bitter note because um, even if it's constructive, it's a note of bitterness towards uh, the corruption of the church of his times. Always there we end up with Dante, but uh, this smoke that comes out is the avarice, is the greed that comes out of uh, the clergy, comes out of the church. And so Dante is saying, I, I am praying, la mente in che si inizia, the, the mind of God, that he looks at how things are, the situation of the church. And uh, with righteous anger, once again, just like it happened in the gospel where Jesus got righteously angry against the merchant in the temple, he hopes that God feels again um, rage for the situation of, of the church. And he draws a parallel with that specific scene in the gospel. He draws a parallel with uh, the fact that uh, Già si solea con le spade far guerra, ma or, today, uh, they are actually making war, even taking away the bread, che il Pio Padre, il, lo pan, il pane in Italian means bread, pane, che il Pio Padre a nessun serra. Our good Lord doesn't deny the, the bread of, uh, of life, the, his word, his uh, spiritual nourishment to anybody. The, the Eucharist, we can say. But in this case, Dante is referring to excommunications that were used for political goals by church leadership uh, in a very dishonest way. And once you were excommunicated, you could not uh, participate in the Eucharist anymore. And, and so this um, Tercet 127 is referring to this problem. Ma tu, che sol per cancellare scrivi, this is a reference to the Pope uh, who was alive during the last years of Dante's life. And that's Pope uh, John XXII. He was Pope between 1316 and uh, 1334. Dante is saying that uh, Pope John XXII, instead of having his desire and his heart set on St. Paul and St. Peter, as he should do, calling St. Peter the pescator, the fisher, his heart is actually set on St. John the Baptist, which is a sarcastic way to mention the florin, il fiorino, the coin of Florence. That's what his heart is on. So how do you like this Canto 18 of Paradiso? Please let me know in, in the comments and let me know any other thoughts you might have. Um, thank you very much for watching, as always, for all the support. And uh, uh, the more we go on, the more these uh, visual representations will be not very easy to picture in our mind. Dante is also challenging our imagination. It's, a, it's an exercise, it's gymnastics for our own imagination. I love this canto very, very much. It, uh, I hope that's clear. So thank you again. Thank you for watching. Bye.